Dom. So Ready? Good. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on this extremely interesting and cutting edge topic in the law. My name is Elena. I am the director of the Parallel Degree Program in International Business Law with the University of London, a partnership between uh, the Russian Presidential Academy and the University of London. And we are very happy to welcome you here today. We have a wonderful panel for you. And um, I think first, I will ask everybody to introduce themselves to our audience. Uh, then we will proceed to um, some thoughts from, from each panelist, approximately 10 minutes uh, of, of those introductory thoughts. Um, we have space for the panelists to ask each other questions in between those if you would like. And then after those, there will be space for everybody to ask questions, um, including audience members. So we hope for a participatory audience today and a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Um, let us begin uh, probably with uh, Eric and then proceed uh, in the order that we discussed. Um, sure, and thank you uh, again very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, in this panel discussion. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Eric Ng. I am uh, currently the managing counsel of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. Uh, we are one of the top three arbitral institutions in the world uh, and one of the top two in uh, Asia and Asia Pacific. Uh, my job as managing counsel is to supervise uh, all of the arbitrations that come across uh, our table. Uh, prior to that job, I was also a barrister uh, in private practice, uh, working primarily in international commercial and investor state arbitration uh, and general civil litigation prior to that. Um, I also have a second career, uh, which uh, I had before this one, which was in IT and tech, and that will become a little bit more relevant uh, when we start talking about the topic which we wanted to talk about today. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to this. Yes, very excited about the IT discussion as well. It's very much a part of this. Um, Victoria. Um, nice to meet you, everyone. Um, good evening from the Hong Kong and uh, good um, afternoon to Moscow. My name is uh, Victoria Kandrumailo. I am a member of the Secretariat of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. I'm working as a counsel in the center and Prior to joining uh, HKC, I worked in um, private practice uh, in Moscow, and I also did my studies both in Russia and um, in Switzerland. Today, I will give the brief introduction, the framework, what the HKC does, and uh, what uh, and uh, to give some highlights on the statistics, which is uh, very relevant despite. Uh, the pandemic that uh, we managed uh, the cases uh, uh, nevertheless. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I know that there's some interesting developments with respect to Russia as well over the past several years. So I think that will be especially uh, good for our audience to hear. Mm -hmm. right. We'll be happy to address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Elena, you are next. Elena. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Go uh, thank you very much for arrangement of uh, this very interesting uh, discussion and uh, paying uh, special attention to the uh, actual uh, issues of international arbitration in Hong Kong and internationally. My name is Elena Mangasarian and I'm an international attorney initially trained at Moscow State University, Russia, and afterwards in uh, the Netherlands and at Columbia University in New York with focusing on uh, intellectual property, including IT matters and uh, uh, commercial and m and issues uh, with having uh, several years of international international practice in uh, major international law firms uh, uh, and uh, afterwards uh, being affiliated with legal solutions uh, business at Thomson Reuters for Russia and CIS. Thank you very much and looking forward to interesting discussion today. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Konstantin, you are next. Uh, 
thank you, Elena. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, great to be here today. My name is Konstantin Kroll. I'm uh, a partner at Dentons and uh, head of Dentons Russian corporate and M&A practice. Uh, I'm uh, triple qualified as a Russian advocate, English solicitor and Irish solicitor, non-practicing. Uh, I'm uh, generally a transactional lawyer, uh, but uh, I'm also an arbitrator. Uh, I'm on the arbitrators list of uh, uh, HKIC, uh, uh, also on the arbitrators list of ICC Russia and uh, two Russian uh, arbitration institutions, which is the uh, Russian Arbitration Center with the Russian Institute of Modern Arbitration and uh, Arbitration Center with the uh, uh, Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs. Uh, I have uh, over 24 years in private practice with leading international law firms in London and in Moscow. Uh, and uh, I'm a graduate of Moscow State University and also have an LLM from the Manchester University in the UK. So looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And last but certainly not least, Alexander, please. Alexander. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm here. Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to meet you all today. Um, my name is Alexander Kukuyev, and I'm a Russian advocate qualified in Russia, uh, graduated from BPP University in London, and also studied in Solicitor's School of QLTS London. I'm a partner of Konishevska and Partners, head of the uh, international litigation practice there, and also represent UK's uh, law firm Gately PLC in Russia, CIS and Ukraine. I'm very much looking forward to the, today's discussion and sending greetings from Moscow. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, just very pleased to have all of you here today. Um, very good atmosphere as well um, as lovely people. So let us begin um, with Victoria. And uh, we already have an order that we discussed, so we will simply begin our, our introductions and presentations and move forward through them. And a reminder that um, as we move through them, uh, of course, if we have questions, especially from one panelist to another, or perhaps I may have a question middle, uh, there is certainly room for that. Um, but to, to try to keep them to about, about 10 minutes or so in length, not counting the questions. Uh, Victoria, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Yelena. So I'm uh, happy to give uh, an introduction to HKC. HKC st stands for the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. And today, HKC has been existing for uh, more than 35 uh, uh, years. And uh, last year, it was the anniversary. We have been founded in 1985. And uh, today, um, we, to date, we have managed over 11,000 uh, cases. We are an um, independent uh, nonprofit organization. Also, um, in uh, the, this year, uh, the uh, Queen. Uh, uh, the Whiten case and uh, Queen Mary University of London issued the survey where HKC has been recognized as the third most uh, preferred arbitral institution in the world. We also uh, can be described as a one-stop uh, one shop which means that um, service, uh, different services can be provided under one roof. Under the services, I mean the arbitration, the mediation, the adjudication, also uh, the domain name disputes and uh, the hearing facilities that um, will be um, covered uh, by Eric, including the virtual hearing that um, HKC conducts. Uh, with respect to the uh, global presence um, in the world, HKC uh, has um, 
uh, three offices. So the main office uh, from where um, the um, all case management uh, is uh, uh, done, uh, located uh, in the Hong Kong. And uh, we also have uh, two offices overseas. Uh, the first uh, overseas office was um, established in Seoul uh, in 2013 uh, in order to address the, address the interest from the uh, Korean um, market users and also in uh, 2015 we opened um, our office uh, in uh, shanghai and um, we became the first um, foreign arbitral um, institution that uh, that established uh, the office uh, in the mainland china we have uh, the transparent um, organizational structure and uh, at the top we have the HKC Council and um, HKC Council can be described as the board of directors. Uh, it's uh, important to note that uh, we have um, a Russian lawyer as a member of HKC Council, Professor Antona Soskov is uh, the member of um, the Council. And um, further, we have the um, uh, executive um, committee, which uh, implements the policies adopted by the Council. We have also um, three uh, specialist standing committee, uh, the Finance and Administration Committee, the Appointments Committee and the Proceedings Committee. Um, the Proceedings Committee and the Appointments Committee are consisted uh, of the well-recognized uh, um, uh, specialists in the arbitration and also in-house. And um, through this committee, HKC uh, makes uh, its decisions uh, on the procedural questions that arise in arbitration and also on all the questions uh, relating to the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. We also have uh, the uh, secretariat of HKC, uh, which uh, consists of the experienced uh, team uh, both uh, in um, investment and international commercial arbitration. The secretariat is led by Miss uh, Sarah uh, Grimmer, uh, who is the Secretary General of HKC. Also, we have a Deputy uh, Secretary General, Joel Yu, and um, uh, Today on the panel, we have our managing council, uh, Mr. Eric G, and uh, I am uh, also a member of uh, the secretariat. Um, I am a council uh, managing uh, the cases on um, a daily basis. It's also uh, important uh, to briefly cover that um, um, the question uh, today of uh, this webinar is the technology and online arbitration. And um, we know that in 2020, the world was hit by pandemic. And uh, it's important to highlight that despite the pandemic, it, uh, 2020 was uh, the record year for HKC uh, in um, the cases and uh, we had uh, 483 new disputes and uh, among them uh, we had uh, uh, 318 arbitration cases and um, what we uh, also um, have seen in the statistics that 72.3% uh, uh, from the cases that we, man, uh, that we handled in 2020 uh, were international cases, meaning that uh, the uh, one party was not uh, from the Hong Kong. 
And uh, the seat of arbitration, Hong Kong, uh, in um, 2020 was um, mostly common chosen uh, seat of arbitration. Also, the most commonly chosen governing law was um, the Hong Kong law. We um, conducted the 80% of the cases we conducted uh, in English. And um, also, we uh, conducted 15.8% in Chinese and 3.4% uh, in Chinese uh, and uh, English, uh, since we have the multilingual uh, secretariat uh, who speaks um, overall uh, 10 languages. Also, um, with respect to the uh, nationalities, uh, we um, evidence that 10 uh, top users uh, of HKC in 2020 was, um, were Hong Kong, mainland China, Vivia, USA, Cayman Island, uh, uh, Singapore, um, South Korea, Korea and um, others. We also uh, can uh, witness the growing um, arbitration uh, caseload, especially we see uh, the increase in uh, the party's um, preference for the uh, administered arbitration. We administer our cases um, under uh, the HKC administered arbitration rules. The most re recent version uh, is of 2018. We also administer cases under ancestral rules. Um, we, for that purpose, we adopted the special HKC procedures. And um, at the end of my presentation, I would like to briefly speak um, about the the uh, status of HKC as um, permanent arbitral institution under Russian law, which um, uh, authorization uh, HKC got in 2019, being uh, the first uh, foreign arbitral institution uh, who got the status. And uh, by virtue of uh, this status, HKC uh, is entitled by law to um, uh, administer the uh, Russian uh, corporate disputes, provided that certain requirements in the dispute are met. Also the procurement disputes and um, also the uh, status of the permanent arbitral institution gives a unique preference to uh, the parties in respect of, for example, the, um, if they wish to waive uh, the Russian court uh, supervision over the arbitration, for example, the challenge of arbitrators by court or the uh, set um, aside of the award, the uh, parties to an arbitration administered by HKC, who has the status of uh, permanent arbitral institution, are entitled to exclude uh, such supervision. And um, from 2019, uh, the moment we got uh, the, um, uh, the license, the status, we had uh, the uh, most uh, cases uh, than we had we had for uh, the uh, three years uh, preceding the uh, obtaining of uh, the status. And I think I will conclude uh, on uh, this uh, point and uh, will be happy to address any questions uh, from my colleagues and the panel and the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. I already have a bunch of questions. I think um, we will not get to them now. I prefer that um, we move through the presentations, but just as a, something to think about, uh, you know, there are questions immediately about what um, the HKIC does so well that makes it so preferred worldwide, right? That's a very interesting point. Um, and second, of course, all of the implications for Russian business and for lawyers and also for um, universities who train lawyers uh, based on this new development. I'm sure there are quite a lot. So I think we can we can get to those points um, a little bit later. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, Eric. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Alina. I, I would can probably address one or two of those points as to you know what makes uh, HKIC a, a little mm -hmm. bit unique and, and, and different. I think uh, as uh, Victoria had mentioned, one of the key reasons that I mean we're, we're seeing popularity in Russia is because of our status as a permanent arbitral institution, but also in relation to uh, the rest of the world, uh, the. Hong Kong's unique position as sort of the gateway to China uh, allows us to have some sort of unique arrangements with uh, mainland China. And considering the level of global trade and the world economy at the moment, uh, having that sort of status with China uh, actually provides uh, significant benefits for parties who are using arbitration uh, in, at the HKIAC. Uh, one of those key arrangements is something which was introduced in 2019, which is the intermeasures arrangement. Uh, that arrangement is specifically between Hong Kong and China, and it makes Hong Kong the only seat uh, outside of China where you can go to a mainland court uh, and retain intermeasures, uh, an injunction to restrain or preserve assets uh, in support of an arbitration which is seated abroad in, in Hong Kong. And that is, I think, one of the key features which you don't find anywhere else in Asia or anywhere else in the world. Um, and so that's one of the key features. Uh, I think the second feature, and that's going to lead into what I want to talk about today, is that we are very much priding ourselves on innovation. Uh, on making sure that we are able to stay on the forefront of arbitration in terms of both making sure that our rules support uh, and cater for new developments and essentially future-proofing uh, the arbitral process for anything which might come down the line in the next few years. And also in terms of, uh, to more relevant to today's subject, technical innovation. Uh, and this was, I think, the most apparent in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, which took place in 2020 and is still ongoing today. Uh, and we, as an institution, uh, especially located just outside of China, uh, we'll, our impact started to be felt uh, around late January to early February of 2020, just as this uh, virus was starting to escape uh, China and was starting to spread around the world. Uh, overnight, uh, international travel was grounded or suspended. Uh, people weren't able to go into the office. Uh, and so from an institution's perspective, we had an immediate decision point to make, which is what do we advise uh, and tell uh, users of HKIC arbitration in respect of whether or not they should postpone their hearing? whether or not they should continue with their hearing, but on a virtual basis. And if we are doing a virtual hearing, how do we do that? Because up until February 2020, uh, you may have had some virtual hearings, but it was not a well-known or a well-used uh, technology. Uh, in truth, that technology had existed beforehand, but what was required was something similar to COVID-19, which helped catalyze the use of that technology and drive innovation uh, through the true necessity. And so from HKI season, end, uh, we are very proud of the fact that we were able to get understand uh, and get a grasp on what was needed in terms of virtual hearings, in terms of supporting our users, and in terms of uh, catering and providing advice for users who are uh, need, in need of our services. And so we were able to turn around quite quickly. Um, from the start of the pandemic and the start of lockdown, uh, we were holding virtual hearings within a week of when uh, lockdown start, first started occurring and, uh, and airports started being closed. And since then, we have done only uh, more and more virtual hearings. In 2020, we had 117 hearings total. Uh, of those 117 hearings, 80 of those hearings were either partially or fully virtual. And when we say partially virtual, that is, uh, you may have also heard that as a hybrid hearing, where you may have groups of people at a certain location, but using something like Zoom or electronic presentation of evidence systems to help connect with each other. A fully virtual hearing uh, is typically when all of the participants are participating from their own ho home or location. And through half of 2020, we had a significant number of fully virtual hearings, simply because 
local restrictions prevented people from being able to travel outside of their own home. That is obviously creates a uh, much more significant logistical problem uh, for the institution, but we have handled that and we have advised clients uh, who are seeking those uh, hearings. We see now at the end of 2020 that the hearings, uh, virtual hearings are here to stay. They are something which are still continuing. And even though uh, travel restrictions may gradually be loosening, um, although with the new Delta variant that, uh, that may be temporary, but over the course of period where we had gradually loosening restrictions, we still had people who preferred virtual hearings, both because it creates a cost savings in many cases uh, by having to save on airfare, by having to save on hotel bills. Uh, and also, it also provides time efficiencies by allowing for people to schedule uh, hearings where they would normally be traveling or to break up a hearing uh, session over the course of several days, where before that wouldn't have been logistically feasible. And so we have seen with virtual hearings, not just a change in the technology uh, and a change in the logistics of a hearing, but also in how we hold hearings in general. The idea of holding a hearing from Monday to Friday from eight to five every day has sort of changed now. And now you might see in a virtual hearing, a hearing that takes place on a Monday and a Wednesday. Uh, on the Monday, it might be from eight to five. And on the Wednesday, it might be six to nine. And so you see now a much more flexible arrangement for uh, virtual hearings to help support arbitration. And when we go back to the original purpose of arbitration, which is that it is meant to be a flexible arrangement to help the parties tailor their dispute resolution method to whatever they wish it to be. Virtual hearings is a critical component of that because it helps enable that flexibility. It helps enforce that flexibility. And so from a technological perspective, although the COVID-19 pandemic has, been, uh, has had serious societal repercussions, there are small silver linings. And in this case, the technological uh, jumpstart to virtual hearings and its use to international arbitration has provided a medium which is sort of driving arbitration into its next generation. Uh, HKIC is also working towards uh, improving that by continuing that technological innovation, both in terms of systems which we will are planning on announcing uh, in the next uh, several months, which will help make it easier for parties to manage and deal with their cases and for tribunals to keep track of uh, current matters and uh, understand their case portfolio, to further support for virtual hearings and further administrative support in terms of our rules and how uh, our next version of rules will cater for technology and technological innovation. So. In conclusion as to what makes HKIC sort of uh, popular uh, in this world, it's both geography and it is uh, you know, innovation. And part of that is again, a, a deep seated commitment on the behalf of the secretariat to make sure that HKIC is, is both efficient and friendly to its users. Because at the end of the day, it is the users who will determine whether or not an arbitral institution can succeed or fail. So uh, I hope that sufficiently answers the question. And uh, I think that that also goes through most of my presentation. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you very much. And same as with Victoria, I'll, I'll share a, a thought that I have that we may like to discuss in a little bit and um, we can all think about it uh, as well. Um, it seems like this is unexpectedly a very good opportunity to talk about a culture of innovation in general, right? So this discussion is of course, primarily about online arbitration and about arbitration and the law, but it would be wrong of me as a moderator to not focus on the very interesting things you said about um, what it seems to be the culture within the HKIC, right? Um, because, uh, it certainly takes a lot of uh, very bold decisions and a lot of structures and systems and, and cultural work to make uh, possible the types of things that you're talking about. So I think I will come back to you um, after the presentations with some questions about that because innovation is certainly uh, a very, very interesting topic and very multidimensional. I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let us move on to Elena now. Elena? 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, before I start, I don't know uh, whether we ha uh, can we follow with some questions to Eric, just immediate questions that uh, came into my sure, mind, sure. Uh, if it's possible. So before I continue, um, uh, of course, uh, taking uh, into account the current trends and the situations that pandemic triggered uh, moving towards uh, virtual hearing and uh, using uh, new technology or existing technology and just adjustment of all the processes and rules uh, to the new reality. In your uh, assessment, uh, to what extent you think uh, uh, the uh, level of technology and uh, the process of virtual hearing will be in place and uh, will be considered more uh, effective uh, in the near future? If, for example, we, uh, let's say, uh, abstain from the pandemic situation, but just in general, based on your uh, professional feelings and based on your assessment. What do you think about the uh, role uh, and efficiency of the, um, uh, let's say, technology-based arbitration, specifically uh, in Hong Kong? Uh, would you like me to answer that now, or shall we? Uh, uh, so, so I think I did mention um, that I think during the pandemic, there were a couple of exceptional circumstances, such as when there were local restrictions which caused lockdowns that prevented people from going into the office. So um, I think if you consider virtual hearings and the whole spectrum of what uh, virtual hearings could consist of, uh, you have physical hearings on one end with uh, sort of maybe some video links to help connect rooms for social distancing. And then on the far end of the spectrum, you have fully virtual hearings, which have um, participants participating from home and each of them is remote. Uh, I think where we'll land is somewhere in the middle. And I think most of the hearings that we'll see once this pandemic is over will consolidate towards that middle. Uh, and they will be primarily hybrid in that you know, when it's possible for people to meet physically, they will obviously want to meet physically. But uh, the barrier as to having a witness provide testimony via a, a video link or to have a virtual component is going to be much lower. And so it will become much more of a tool in the uh, arbitrator's toolkit. Um, it may not be a necessity to have a virtual hearing, but it's no longer also a necessity to, uh, to schedule two years in advance because that's the only time you can get flights uh, or get a whole week off uh, to attend to a hearing. Now you could uh, make it more efficient time-wise by having a virtual component. Uh, and not having to work across you know, what can be some very extensive legal teams and witnesses and parties uh, for an arbitration. And so I think what we'll see in the end of this day, uh, end of this uh, road is sort of a, a hybrid model uh, for hearings and that will take up the bulk of, uh, of the process. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. It's a very, very interesting uh, prospect. So, and uh, I prepared a brief presentation, Jed, but more for illustration of uh, some uh, review for uh, using of online uh, resources that could be helpful in terms of uh, supporting arbitration process, specifically in uh, uh, under the current situation. And uh, when we move on, I think that uh the um let's say temporarily moving towards using of online informational resources and technology in course of international arbitration and colleagues could agree or <laughs> disagree with that it's already started before uh, this trend uh, has already been in place before uh the pandemic hit the uh the whole world and uh, specifically use of uh international uh, international uh resources or jurisdictional uh resources based on uh review and the approaches of the domestic uh, uh, laws, the interpretation in terms of international arbitration context is becoming more important and uh, efficient use of these resources by lawyers, training them and learning how to use them efficiently is becoming more and more uh, demanded skills, not only for experienced uh, professionals, specifically in, in the area of arbitration, but also for uh, the students students or for the lawyers who are tending to develop further and to get additional qualifications or uh, kind of 
uh, use of the resources in a different way. And uh, of course, we all, uh, it's obvious that uh, in terms of the current trends and due to the pandemic situation, when the necessity to work online at, uh, no, if we focus on arbitration procedures, so uh, of course uh, it uh, demanded to turn to the virtual hearing and all the preliminary activity to uh, get documentation done, to get analysis of the uh, domestic law uh, get uh, practical knowledge of the respective uh, rules of process and uh, um, forming and drafting uh, necessary documents and collection of uh, documentary evidences for the procedure. Uh, it uh, demanded operative use of various uh, uh, global resources, uh, providing uh, effective legal research and using the new uh, technologies that allow to find the information fast uh, to to ensure that it's accurate, up to date, and apply to the uh, to the um, current situation, specifically when we talk about the preparation for virtual hearing, when uh, there is extended informational exchange uh, between the lawyers in different jurisdictions. So it's uh, all demands uh, further development of the necessary legal research skills. And uh, as far as I see the trends, uh, also as a tutor, of this dual degree program and as a practitioner, I can see that the uh, young generation of lawyers uh, would uh, focus and uh, will base their activity mostly on using uh, the technology because uh, and the efficient use of the technology. And for example, I can uh, just illustrate how the uh, elementary PowerPoint presentation can help the clients and can help the uh, participants of arbitration process uh, uh, not only uh, uh, the professionals who are arbitrator, but for uh, lawyers representing the interest of the respective parties uh, can probably help. And the format of the uh, presentations, whatever uh, in whatever style, with the li immediate link to the uh, respective international uh, uh, informational resources can probably uh, be used as an efficient tool for um, saving time for for uh, increasing the efficiency of preparation process and for legal research process and so for practical resolving of the respective uh, tasks that are facing by the participants of international arbitration process. So um, if uh, you can uh, uh, scroll the slides further, please. Uh, that's, for example, if uh, so the new client and the new arbitration uh, procedure is being started and the arbitrators or the um, uh, 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 Participants of the uh, of the court uh, can uh, should provide a brief extract and provide uh, extract of the information how the pro whole process should be organized. It can be uh, given in a very bullet point style, and you know, taking into account that uh, again going uh, to the situation when uh, the young generation used to work in very structured, very let's say clip style uh, way of thinking, uh, maybe. Uh, such structure of information would provide them more visualized and more up to point um, description of the main stages of the procedure. So if you can scroll further. So Yes, and then, uh, of course, uh, it's possible to clearly brief the positions of the claimant and of the respondent, uh, make the list of the documents and uh, move forward in uh, uh, such a very um, uh, precise and very short uh, way of uh, presenting the materials. Just, just please, please move forward. And, uh, of course, uh, this structure of information can help uh, the parties of the arbitration uh, procedure uh, structure their positions in a very brief way uh, before going deeply into details. And when we talk about the uh, new flexibility, a uh, new way, a level of fle flexibility of the process, when uh, it, uh, the people uh, concern about the time saving, when they're working online, when they're uh, moving to, again, virtual uh, environment, uh, this way of uh, exchanging of information probably could uh, help uh, help them to become more uh, 
precisely and more efficiently prepared for the whole process. And for the lawyers and arbitrators, it will help also to uh, structure their work in a very, um, very efficient way, just uh, general impression. Please move on. And uh, of course, if uh, the, the next uh, situation when uh, the pr arbitration procedure moves uh, online, it's of course a sharing of the structured up-to-date information and provide additional information about the process of formation of the arbitration panel, depending on the arbitration institution in place. And of course, uh, such brief summaries will help the people to uh, find uh, more details uh, at the later stage, but provides will provide them with an overview of the formation uh, of the formation of the tribunal process and uh, further stage of arbitrational procedure uh, specifically we take into account that the clients and participants of the process for example uh, uh, facing the arbitration process for the first time so please move on and uh, of course, if we come to the brief description of the stages of uh, arbitrations, it could be some nuances to be uh, added, like revocation and challenge of arbitrators. So just in order to uh, provide more details for the parties. Please, please move on. And uh, just going further, because uh, if we come to the point of using of online resources, I would be glad to provide some overviews. Please go ahead. Just to 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 this yes, and uh, actually, if we come to the uh, uh, key uh, uh, legal information resources that provide uh, for uh, some detailed content concerning um, uh, collection of the information with focus on uh, arbitration matters. And uh, first of all, I uh, I know that uh, uh, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center has a very good database of all arbitration arbitral awards that have been. Uh, uh, pro pro uh, protest uh, through the Hong Kong International Arbitration Court and the database uh, that you created uh, demonstrate a very high level of innovations and technology at convenience for the clients, for the arbitrators and for those uh, scholars and uh, um, practitioners uh, who are interested uh, in specialization uh, with focus on uh, Hong Kong uh, International Arbitration Courts. So, and uh, as uh, Mr. Engs uh, uh, mentioned that your focus on uh, innovation uh, implementation in terms of uh, making uh, the procedure comfortable, in terms of providing a very good collection of the informational resources and awards and procedural matters of Hong Kong International Arbitration Court became, uh, I think that it's, it's the most advanced uh, resource that will be very helpful for uh, uh, practitioners again for uh, uh, students, for prospect students, and uh, uh, I think this is a very, very good ex uh, example and experience that could be uh, used as a hallmark uh, trend. But of course, we all practitioners, we are familiar with uh, global uh, legal databases that provide consolidated um, uh, resources uh, of, with respect to international arbitration in general, and uh, we, uh, with with respect to each uh, arbitration institution uh, uh, in particular. So, and plus, uh, of course, as far as the modern uh, world, uh, irrespective of the pandemic, but pandemic, of course, uh, had a trigger to develop it further, uh, moving uh, online, using of uh, social uh, network, uh, using of uh, new um, uh, video resources, of course, new blocks uh, situations. It uh, uh, provides very wide spectrum of uh, professional information that can be efficiently used for uh, international arbitration process in order to make it more informative, easier to understand, and uh, serve the whole procedure uh, in a very efficient, uh, cost-saving and time-saving way. And uh, here, just uh, for informational purposes, I provided just examples of the helpful links that could be uh, used and uh, provide very consolidated uh, uh, resources uh, regarding 
international arbitration, just not in terms of the uh, pr product placement, but just in terms of the consolidated links that uh, gives uh, the lawyers, arbitrators, and practitioners the fast access to the uh, focused information and the respective content that can be used virtually in course of the process, in course of the uh, real uh, arbitration procedure and virtual hearing. So, and I really hope that this brief overview could be helpful for informational resources and would be happy to answer your questions and provide more details uh, in, in further way. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much. Um, I will again sort of highlight one point of interest, which we will get to after everyone's presentations, but just as, as fair warning, what I'm going to ask. Uh, I think it's a very good jumping off point from what you said to talk about the skills that lawyers will need going forward, right? And what educational institutions can do. So everything from, you mentioned work with technology to work with extremely large sets of information, uh, database, uh, social networks, cultural considerations, um, anything and everything in that realm, we can, we can certainly discuss because um, these types of changes in the world and as we began discussing with Eric, right, the culture of innovation in general presumes uh, a much broader skill set than what is often taught um, and how lawyers are trained. So we can we can certainly get to that. Um, thank you very much. And we move on to Constantine. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Yelena. Um, uh, colleagues, I'd like to, to start uh, by reflecting on uh, something that uh, Victoria has said about the uh, uh, HKC status as permanent arbitral institution in, in Russia. Uh, uh, but, but first, uh, taking a step back uh, uh, and talking about uh, uh, Russian parties arbitrating internationally, uh, I start with saying that uh, since the uh, Soviet time, the uh, most popular venues, uh, which were considered sort of neutral, uh, were uh, Helsinki in Finland and Stockholm in Sweden and sometimes Switzerland. But then starting from the uh, early 90s, the, uh, uh, the form of choice and almost by default uh, has become the London Court of International Arbitration, LCA. Uh, so uh, some of the most uh, complex and uh, large uh, disputes involving Russian and CIS parties uh, were heard uh, in London. And uh, while uh, uh, LCIA maintains uh, uh, the probably the leading role in terms of the number of Russia and CS related disputes, uh, this, this trend has started to change. And uh, I believe it has started to change uh, back in 2014 uh, with the uh, implementation of the first Russia related sanctions. So since then, uh, I. Um, uh, and not just uh, myself, but I think the market uh, uh, observes a trend that uh, many Russian uh, companies uh, are now opting to arbitrate uh, in, in Asia. So they look for an alternative for LCIA. And uh, this is not just uh, uh, sanctioned companies. And uh, I will stress that. So uh, companies that are not sanctioned uh, in any way, but uh, sometimes uh, they have concerns about potential sanctions or if they're state owned. Uh, so they, they're interested in alternatives. And sometimes uh, they consider uh, having an arbitration clause which provides for alternative venues. Uh, they're sometimes called uh, a cascade. Uh, so uh, it says that maybe it's sort of London as a first choice, but then if there are sanctions or any other reason preventing a party uh, to arbitrate in London, then it's Hong Kong, uh, for example. And sometimes we, we, we see a few layers. And these uh, cascade clauses, they have their own issues, but nevertheless, it's worth mentioning that uh, the market uh, is now seeing this developing trend. Uh, so uh, as Victoria said, Hong Kong Arbit International Arbitration Center was the first international arbit uh, uh, permanent arbitration institution, which was accredited uh, by the Russian Ministry uh, of Justice, and thus uh, uh, was uh, became able to uh, administer Russian corporate disputes uh, in the territory of the Russian Federation. So certain other types of disputes, 
The second one was the Vienna International Arbitration Center, uh, also in 2019. And now most recently, just uh, about a month ago, uh, two more prominent arbitral institutions, uh, Singapore International Arbitration Center and ICC Court of International Arbitration in Paris, uh, have also become accredited. But of, uh, of these four that are now accredited, only HKIC and SIAC uh, are uh, in the jurisdictions uh, that have not implemented any Russia-related sanctions. So uh, uh, while VIAC and ICC are accredited, uh, but for uh, certain parties, uh, the concern remain that uh, 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 France and uh, uh, Austria as uh, EU members uh, are uh, sort of part of the EU sanctions program uh, relating to Russia. And therefore, HKAC and SIAC may seem preferential for certain uh, market parties because of the uh, sanctions-related concerns. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to say a few words about the uh, phenomenon of, uh, a new phenomenon of online uh, sort of hearings. And of course, the technology uh, has been there for a while, but traditionally, uh, uh, and in particular, large and important hearings were uh, conducted live, uh, sort of off offline, uh, in sort of real, uh, in, in the traditional way. Uh, and of course, all of that has changed since the uh, pandemic started. And uh, I think now uh, all living international arbitration centers uh, have taken advantage of the technology uh, to conduct hearings online. And uh, I have uh, firsthand. Uh, experience of uh, conducting online hearings as uh, a sole arbitrator at two Russian arbitration centers. So uh, I have done hearings uh, online at uh, a Russian arbitration center with the Russian Institute of Modern Arbitration and also uh, at the arbitration center at the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs. Uh, so both, both centers uh, use different uh, online platforms for their hearings, uh, but uh, both uh, platforms worked absolutely fine. Uh, the parties were absolutely happy uh, to attend online and uh, everything was very uh, efficient. Uh, and uh, I would add to that, that uh, in particular, uh, I think that online hearings can be very attractive when parties are coming from different jurisdictions. And when it's not a matter of uh, taking a train from Paris to London, which is not uh, a big trouble. Uh, but if, if you one party is in Australia and uh, the other is in uh, Novosibirsk or Vladivostok in Russia, and uh, uh, the venue is, uh, say, London, uh, then actually uh, getting all, all the parties and council to uh, hearings in London, which may take a few days, is, uh, uh, is a huge effort and expense as well. Uh, so uh, online uh, hearings uh, provide, uh, I, I believe, a viable alternative. So uh, hopefully, and fingers crossed, the pandemics, uh, the pandemic is going to be uh, over, hopefully sooner rather than later, but I trust that the uh, technology is going to stay. And I'm not saying that everything is going to be on online because online hearings have their own uh, disadvantages and it uh, requires new skills in terms of advocacy. Uh, uh, and equipment, but uh, I think it is a viable alternative and it can make process easier and cheaper, uh, which is an uh, imp important feature in arbitration, of course, because efficiency is important uh, in arbitration. And finally, I would say uh, a few words about uh, uh, the impact on uh, education, uh, because, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, this uh, event today is under the auspices of the uh, Russian Presidential Academy. Uh, so, of course, our program at the Russian uh, Presidential Academy, which coincided uh, uh, with, with the uh, uh, COVID pandemic, uh, has has been done online, and I believe it it worked uh, just fine. And uh, I also lecture at uh, the uh, Russian uh, High School of Economics, and there I lecture online, and uh, also uh, it it works fine. Of course, my uh, personal preference because I have basis for comparison and I have lectured offline and when you do it offline there is a bit of more interaction with the audience and uh, uh, I'd say it feels better. Uh, 
but uh, on the other hand, uh, online courses, they have their own advantages because they can bring together people uh, which are, who are very far away. Well, I can give you an example. Uh, I'm uh, a fellow at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in London and uh, a vice president of the Russian chapter of CIRB. So I'm actively involved in CIRB initiatives uh, on education and uh, training courses in the field of arbitration. So last, last autumn, I myself uh, uh, took uh, an online course uh, organized by the Brazilian uh, branch of CIRB. Uh, which had uh, excellent, uh, ex excellent program and uh, sort of uh, fantastic uh, uh, composition of tutors. And uh, before uh, before last year, uh, this course uh, always took place offline uh, in in Brazil. And realistically, I would I would have never ever been able to travel to Brazil to take to take that course because just of the sheer distance. So last year, I was able to participate and meet a fantastic cohort of uh, fellow students because they were all coming from Brazil and other jurisdictions in uh, Latin America and the rest of the world. So uh, it was a very diverse audience and very different from uh, the one that I would get should I attend the course uh, in Europe or uh, in, in Russia. So I think that is an example of how sometimes sort of a, a maybe disadvantage like a pandemic creates an opportunity uh, as I think there is a Chinese saying that there is an opportunity uh, in every crisis. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, online opportunities for uh, education are enormous. Uh, and, and finally, I would just uh, uh, sort of wrap up with uh, a few other examples of how online works very well. Uh, I'm sort of fortunate to uh, arbitrate moot course uh, for a number of years. And previously I've done it uh, offline, of course, but uh, in the past year and this spring, I've uh, arbitrated Shanghai Vismut. And, and then in Russia, I arbitrated uh, moot court uh, named after Professor Mazolin and uh, uh, Professor Rosenberg uh, moot course. Everything was done online. Uh, uh, students were coming from universities from uh, all over Russia in Russian moots and of course uh, in uh, Shanghai, this moot it was just truly international, and uh, uh, it worked really, really well. And I think for uh, for students uh, it's a great advantage because they cannot always visit uh, different jurisdictions. It takes uh, uh, budget to do that, and online I think that uh, it makes it all the more affordable. Uh, so I think that. Uh, uh, rather than concentrating on the sort of negative aspects of the uh, sort of current global situation, I think there are also a lot of positive developments that uh, we, we should uh, uh, sort of identify and uh, take advantage of. Uh, so that's that's all from me, and I'd be happy to address any questions at the end. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you so, so much. Um, in the interest of time, we will very quickly move on to Alexander without any offense whatsoever to Constantine. We will certainly come back. Um, there are just so many positive things in what you said, and I want to focus on that um, after after Alexander. So Alexander, uh, please go ahead. Hi. Hi again. Well, I'll be short in my uh, speech. The few trends I wanted to talk about, the first one being covered by Eric. Thank you. Uh, which is uh, online trend and being as an arbitrator of the arbitration center with the Russian um, um, uh, RSPP, uh, Russian Union of uh, Industrialists and Interpreters, I, uh, as, um, I have uh, seen the interest uh, of, of the, I'm oh, sorry, apologies, apologies. I've seen the interest of um, the market and the business on the online um, um, online arbitration. And I see the development of the arbitration center um, of Russian Union of Industrialists and Interpreters. Uh, the, secondly, I would like to say that I very much salute the decision of the Minister of Justice of the Russian Federation to grant uh, here uh, opening uh, in Russia. 
thirdly, I would like to um, point out that uh, uh, the um, the point which was covered by Eric uh, on the uh, cultural awareness and multilingual uh, covering of the arbitration processes in IAC, uh, I welcome it as well because uh, uh, being born in a Buddhist society, raised in Moscow, uh, spent four and a half years in Seychelles and year in Europe, I very much welcome cultural awareness. I uh, welcome uh, multi-language uh, uh, proceedings and um, uh, what uh, local Russian markets also uh, observes at the moment, I can see that there is the, there is um, much interest on the uh, providing the students of the moot court um, um, uh, and um, uh, moot court on the rules of uh, the Russian arbitration sentence. And I believe one of the trends of HIAC might be uh, providing uh, Russian students with the opportunity to uh, to have such mood courts on the HIAC rules in Russia. And the last point which I would like to uh, point out is the influence of the artificial intelligence on the arbitration processes all over the world. Uh, that would be my question to uh, Eric, if you allow me. What you see uh, in the future Will the artificial intelligence be one of the options to pre-assess the result of the future arbitration process? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, let us uh, probably now we will begin sort of this more uh, more discussion aspect. So I will remind our audience as well, those of you who are not watching on YouTube, those of you who are actually in Zoom with us, you may um, you know, certainly write your questions uh, to the chat um, or you can raise your hand as well. And I think we will begin with Alexander's question um, regarding artificial intelligence to Eric. And then I will also say that um, for Alexander, I have a question as well, which is you began discussing um, the benefits, right, of the multicultural proceedings. And I would love for you to elaborate sure. more on exactly what those benefits are, because I think it's a good point. Sure. Um, I guess I can start on the artificial intelligence point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, AI and international arbitration is a very interesting uh, topic and an interesting subject. And uh, I know, I mean, it, it depends, and this is going to be a very lawyer-like question, but I mean, if in order to answer it, you kind of have to define what you mean by uh, artificial intelligence, because the the scope of what AI can encompass is actually quite large. Uh, at the on one end of the spectrum, you have you know what we call expert determination systems, um, and these sort of expert systems have been used uh, by law firms and by data uh, you know. Uh, data mining and uh, other sort of e-discovery services for several years now. And they are you know, being used more and more commonly, at least on the firm's end, uh, in relation to helping identify sort of patterns and trends and, uh, and recognize uh, you know, certain uh, pieces of evidence and things like that. So if we are talking about something like on the expert systems end, then I think that that sort of uh, is already on the rise. Uh, and will probably be more and more prevalent in the future. Now, if you are talking about you know something closer to an actual determination system or an adjudicative system in relation to AI, where which would analyze the facts of each circumstance and render a decision, I don't think we're we're quite there yet. Um, I think the you know some people have sort of mentioned online dispute resolution as as you know, removing humans from the equation entirely. Uh, and I think probably that's a little bit too far on the other side of the spectrum for us to really be discussing today. 
Um, the truth is that we'll probably see it something in more in the terms of uh, on the use of counsel on the end of counsel to help identify patterns, help identify exhibits and evidence, help uh, you know go past some of the the previous steps of having a, uh, uh, an intern or a trainee review every document or every exhibit. Uh, and that's where AI will probably help us. Uh, it may help us also in identifying, you know, uh, predictive patterns for funders in terms of, you know, uh, you know, chances of success or, or, or something like that. But I don't think you would really necessarily see that replace what you would uh, normally see in terms of an arbitrator. Um, uh, I hope that's clear enough in terms of at least my thoughts on it. Thank you very much. That's what I meant. I meant the, um, developing the system which would render the decisions um, accounting all the all the uh, factual background of two parties and do necessary pre-assessment. And I can see your point. Thank you very much. If uh, Elena allows me, I will uh, shortly cover the cultural awareness in two points. Firstly, um, as, as I said, uh, uh, doing uh, arbitration before the LCIA and ICC, I've managed to see the cultural uh, differences between the parties I represented, Russians, Indian parties, and European ones. And um, the, the trend I see is to be, being uh, culturally uh, aware is uh, me, means uh, to understand uh, the cultural differences of uh, both parties. In one of the disputes, I um, had an opportunity to participate. There were two parties, both uh, French speaking um, from uh, Seychelles. However, the beneficials were from two different countries, India and Russia. So uh, the ICC's decision on the uh, choosing the arbitrator was to choose the uh, French-speaking arbitrator uh, from Canada, from independent country, um, having experience working in India and in Russia both. I could see his uh, good knowledge of cultural differences of two parties and good management of the uh, ICC process in that case. And secondly, um, uh, being a part of um, uh, being a part of the uh, working group of BRICS legal forum, I can see that uh, there is a process of connecting uh, different institutions from those countries, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, South Africa and China. Uh, I can see that we are getting closer and closer uh, to each other in uh, having something which which could be an uh, international uh, international arbitration institute of BRICS countries without uh, incorporating the new ones, the new institutions, but by uh, linking the existing ones, such as uh, for instance, uh, Russian uh, in, uh, Russian uh, arbitration center with the uh, Russian Union of Interpreters and uh, Industrialists and other existing institutions in those countries. Um, do you believe that HIAC could be a part of the growing BRICS institution, Eric? Uh, I mean, it's it's always possible. I, I would say at, at the moment there isn't uh, a firm plan <laughs> for, for that. Um, uh, nothing I could really you know sort of discuss at, at this stage. But I mean, it's it's we're always open to sort of new possibilities in in respect, especially in relation to bricks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give a chance to our panelists to ask each other questions. So the same holds for you. There's a function where you can raise your hand. 
So, or you may just uh, start speaking as well. Um, but in the event that many people start speaking, there's that function. So do you all have questions that you would like to ask each other as a, as a start to our discussion uh, in the same way that Alexander did? If not, I have questions for sure. Uh, <laughs> so um, I would like to perhaps uh, ask a question of, of Eric, um, the one that, that I asked before about the culture of innovation. And from then on, we will, I'd like to move on to the opportunities for business and for local courts um, for education. This is a very opportunities minded uh, webinar today. So uh, for Eric, uh, I'm very curious about, uh, as I mentioned before, this this culture and the systems and mechanisms that you have in place within the HKIC in order to allow for a long-term view, right? In order to allow mm -hmm. for innovation, in order in this example to allow for um, a very uh, efficient sort of an accurate, both at the same time response to the pandemic from your institution. Um, these are no small feats by any means. And so I'm wondering if you uh, could speak to those. Uh, sure. And I, I don't think, well, um, I think when you're talking about a, a culture um, or it, whether it be a business culture or a strategic culture or, or, or anything like that, it's, it's not something which can be done simply by saying, well, we want to be innovative. So everybody think of something innovative and, 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 and do it that way. Um, I think the reason we have a culture of innovation is because we, we, at a much more granular, much more fundamental level, we think very closely about the users. We think very closely about if I am a party or if I'm a council who is going into arbitration, what do I, what do I want to see? You know, um, I want to have a quick response. I want to be able to use technology. I want to be able to, um, you know, have a hearing without having to go somewhere else. You know, or 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 work through another group of people. So I think from from our perspective, uh, we treat it very much at a much more fundamental level, which is, uh, you know, we are a service institution, and therefore, you know, we have to look at what our users want, and innovation sort of comes from that because the the need for virtual hearings, the need for uh, online dispute resolution stems from what we're seeing from our council, uh, from our users, from our from our uh, from that feedback, and it does require from us us to sort of look ahead a little bit, um, and we have the advantage, as Victoria said, of having a very forward-looking committee and council who help guide uh, some of these decisions, and obviously our secretary general uh, does a lot of that as well. But it all stems from a need to better cater. What can we do next? What can we do better for the users? And I think that's what sort of fosters uh, eventually a culture. A culture ari then arises organically from you know, sort of those sort of seeds. Um, I think if you would try to falsely you know, impose a culture and simply say, you know, we intend to be the most innovative you know, institution in the world, people won't know what to do with that. They won't know how do I do that? Or if they do, they'll be doing it you know, they'll be instituting technology for technology's sake. Um, whereas from us, you know, uh, and the way we are, we're approaching things is everything that we're doing, we're doing because we know that will make life easier or better for the users. That makes a lot of sense. And I imagine that there's also elements of trust building and, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, the <laughs> very Absolutely. fundamental things. Yes, trust is, is a very big thing as they say it makes things a lot quicker and, and more flexible. Um, I would like to ask a question to anybody, any of the panelists as well. What lessons, uh, moving into the, the lessons phase of this, what lessons do you think there are for domestic courts, for example, right, to learn from uh, leading institutions such as the HKIC? Because I know that there are, for example, um, some Certainly, there's a digitization process going on with domestic courts within Russia, which is very interesting. Um, and so what are what are some of the lessons that we can learn uh, from the work being done internationally? Uh, any of the panelists may raise your hand or I will just call on people otherwise. Um, Elena, mm -hmm. I see I'm your hand. Prob 
Yes, I would probably just uh, bring up one brief comment in terms of, uh, yes, uh, a kind of uh, Im implementation and integration of the best practices demonstrated by the most advanced uh, arbitration institution like definitely Hong Kong International Arbitration Center is uh, into the domestic procedures. And right now, uh, the, maybe uh, the positive sign of uh, uh, pandemic situations that most of jurisdictions start to look at each other's experience in terms of how to uh, use uh, the information technology more efficiently, which technology would be uh, more efficient rather than others. And it was, I think, the, and the taking into account that, for example, in Russia, not only with respect to the arbitration uh, procedure, but also turning to the digitalization of the judicial procedures. And there is a kind of national program at this moment to uh, create electronic justice and develop and implement the best technologies, I think from this perspective, the experience and uh, innovative experiences that uh, definitely used and uh, successfully demonstrated by uh, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center as a leading uh, um, judicial institutions worldwide will be used domestically as well. And exchange of the best practice, exchange of the information, exchange of the expertise will be coming the most uh, important thing at this moment in order to uh, make the things uh, existing and developing further from the digital point of view and from the digital transformation point of you, I think. Just a brief comment on this matter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everybody else, feel free to also jump in if you have comments. Um, um, yes. Oh, I'm also curious about the opportunities for business, right? Um, and because if things are moving so quickly in dispute resolution and are changing, in some ways are expanding many things, right? And this is, again, a question for everybody to so just either start speaking or raise your hand. How should you know, there's there's a perspective of how should lawyers think of it, and then there's a different perspective of how should business uh, think of the possibilities that that these mechanisms open up, right? I think Russia is probably a very good example, right? If we have uh, now um, the HKAC is having status within Russia, how should Russian businesses look at this? What opportunities does it create? So a broad question for you all. Constantine, Eric. Uh, thank you, Ilana. Let, let me say a few, uh, uh, a few words. Uh, well, indeed, we, uh, for the past year and a half, we were living in a sort of uh, a perfect storm, uh, which has, uh, uh, as, as always, demonstrated uh, and identified both weaknesses and strengths. And uh, whereas for, uh, for some businesses, uh, uh, obviously, like uh, hospitality and uh, uh, tourism and uh, restaurants, these sectors of the economy, uh, the uh, consequences have been really hard. Uh, and uh, air travel, not another example. So, uh, so uh, they they're really suffering. But for some other industries, these uh, uh, this has given them a boost. And uh, for example, uh, various sort of uh, those who do deliveries of food and goods. Uh, so for, for their businesses, it's been great. And if we look at the legal business, which is uh, clearly uh, very close to, to my heart, uh, if, we, if we look uh, at the uh, uh, information on uh, uh, profits of uh, law firms in the city of London, for example, we, which have recently been revealed, uh, so we can see that all the leading firms have uh, posted uh, record growth uh, of profits. So why, why is that? Well, part, part, uh, part of it is just because the pandemics have uh, uh, has raised a lot of issues and problems for the clients, and law firms were well positioned to advise the clients in, in this context, and thus there was a lot of work. But there is uh, also uh, an, another factor is that uh, uh, leading law firms have all invested in technology. So, uh, so for us, switching to uh, a remote and online mode of working was not a problem at all because we, we all had our IT in place. We, we had our sort of cloud-based uh, systems in place. So uh, it was maybe a psychological uh, problem uh, for some, but uh, from the uh, technology perspective, uh, we, we were well prepared. And 
I, I can say that from uh, uh, my, my own uh, uh, personal experience, uh, it was not even a psychological uh, uh, problem because for, for, for a number of years previously in uh, my career and life, I had to uh, uh, sort of switch time between Moscow and London and uh, commute permanently between the two cities. So I developed uh, a habit of uh, working on, online and uh, working on, on, the, on the road, on the move. So, uh, and also I, because of that, I, I had sort of built an, an office at home uh, in, in Moscow when I was residing in London. So all of that has helped me uh, uh, to, uh, to be adjusted to, to, to work remotely. So for me, it was an easy uh, switch. So, uh, uh, so therefore, I think the lesson, is your question is what are the lessons and the takeaways? So the lesson is that uh, the, the modern world uh, has become very volatile and the uh, speed and pace of change is unprecedented. Never in the human uh, humankind history uh, we have experienced change at that speed. So, uh, and therefore, even the best education, uh, uh, the ch ch chance if uh, one looks at education as just facts that you memorize, then uh, they may well become obsolete in just a few few years uh, upon graduation. So now the education needs to be not just about uh, sort of learning uh, some existing knowledge, but uh, it needs to prepare you to educate yourself, to adjust and to develop and to embrace new knowledge and to create new knowledge yourself. Uh, and same in business, same in business. So old rules and all formulas may no longer work. So what in order to survive, we need to be able to quickly adjust uh, and maybe change uh, change our protocols and do something new and something better. And uh, it may well become even more profitable uh, in, in the end. So it may become uh, better than the old ways. Uh, so yes, we were taking ourselves out of the comfort zone, uh, but in, in return, uh, we get very, very quick change because previously, uh, in order to achieve change, it could take years and years and even a lifetime to see a change. And now these days, uh, we sometimes things change as we speak. So it's, it's both worrying, but uh, it can also be uh, great. Uh, and, and of course, uh, it's, not, it's not the end of the road. I think we'll, we'll see uh, further market shocks and surprises, for example, in commercial real estate when uh, more and more businesses will realize that they don't need a classical office, or maybe they don't need such a large office. But then, on the other hand, maybe there will be growth of uh, sort of core sharing options. So who knows? So the, the future is wide open. So I think that's, again, I'll end saying just that we need to be uh, sort of open-minded, think out of the box, be enthusiastic and uh, energetic, and be prepared for change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody else has thoughts, jump in. I would also like to ask about um, switching a little bit back more to the perspective of lawyers, right? If we talk about businesses and how their mindset uh, should be working, that is one thing, but we can also talk about regulators, for example, right? So um, lessons that regulators uh, can take from this and uh, things that they should be paying attention to, right, in order uh, to not squash some of these innovations. On the other hand, to take into account, uh, for example, um, how rules of evidence may be shifting because of the practice coming out of online arbitration and, and online court proceedings, uh, rules of how to interact with witnesses, right? And, and things like that. Um, I would also raise in the same context, the question of how civil law jurisdictions versus common law jurisdictions uh, you know, may be more or less comfortable in online proceedings and how uh, domestic uh, courts right, and, and regulators can, can think about these issues. So again, a question to everybody, um, but we can begin with Eric uh, and Victoria and, and then uh, Juan, but I saw Constantine also nodding, so I may come back to you on this question. Uh, Eric, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to, you know, talk about. I think again, in terms of uh, innovation, I think we have, uh, you know, you see in terms of regulation, 
you know, one thing we have to, we, we have to try and do in our rules is is make sure that we are able to you know cater again, like I said, future proofing um, in terms of how lawyers are intending to change and making things more efficient. I think we actually have uh, a couple of procedures in our 2018 rules. I think Victoria, I don't know if you wanted to uh, maybe talk a little about maybe our expedited procedure and, and, and docs only procedures. Actually, I think she might be, she might be frozen at the moment. Um, so, so maybe I will, uh, I, I will mention that. I think um, under the 2018 rules, we've actually included procedures for uh, expedited arbitration, uh, which allows for parties to get a an award six months after the uh, case file has been transmitted to the tribunal, which is you know a significantly shorter time frame uh, as compared to you know previous uh, or a, a full procedure award. Uh, there's also an early determination procedure which we introduced in our 2018 rules, which helps uh, allow for, you know, unmeritorious claims or vexatious claimants to be, to there have the claims dismissed or a uh, summary judgment in certain cases without having to go to a full hearing or uh, a full award. And in those sort of situations, uh, those are sort of the procedural sides of innovation that we see, uh, that we think about um, when we look at, uh, you know, setting up these sort of innovations and catering for you know how uh, changes is, is happening in terms of arbitration and, and being able to accommodate for that. Victoria, you're back. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, if I may add, Eric, uh, on that. Yeah, apologies uh, for some troubles with uh, my connection so i also want to add that um, we it's important for the institution uh, to uh, remain uh, flexible and uh, think uh, even a bit beforehand i think when the provisions on the um, on the uh, encouraging the tribunal to use the technology were introduced in 2018 rules. Of course, nobody in that time didn't uh, even uh, think about uh, the pandemic and uh, uh, later in 2020, this uh, provision was of most help to the tribunal uh, to consider the um, uh, using of the virtual hearing. And uh, also, uh, for example, the submissions that uh, can be filed with HKC, we um, um, always um, uh, accept uh, with uh, no issue the uh, submissions by email. Uh, and uh, that's uh, also very helpful, uh, especially with the disruption of the career services uh, around uh, the world. And um, I would also want to add that, um, like my personal view on the uh, on this comparison uh, between the uh, like physical press presence and the virtual component, uh, as said by Eric before, I think that the uh, the the most um, efficient um, way uh, for the users, it will be this combined approach. Because, for example, we cannot, um, I think we cannot uh, avoid the physical component at all. For example, in a situation when we have the other party non participating and uh, the uh, service of the documents will have to be uh, done not only by online means, by, but by also to all the addresses that uh, are available to the institution or the uh, arbitrators. So um, I think um, that's uh, my thoughts uh, on the uh, uh, virtual comp component arbitration. I think Victoria is having issues with her internet. Are you back? Yes, I can hear yes. you. Can you hear me? Good. Yes. yes, you are back. You disappeared for a little while, but you are back now. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Alexander, Alina, Constantine, do you have further thoughts on, on what Eric and uh, Victoria said or on the question in general? Mm -hmm. I, 
Yes, if, if I may uh, add uh, maybe more to, to your uh, question, you know, sort of comparison of uh, civil law and common law uh, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I'd say it has uh, probably more to do not just the family of law, common law, civil law, but sort of more for uh, cultural tradition in the uh, judiciary. Uh, because in Russia, I gave early examples how uh, online hearings were embraced by the arbitral institutions, but uh, I must say it's different at state courts. So the technology is available at the state courts. So in theory, they could conduct uh, uh, hearings uh, uh, in the same manner as uh, 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 arbitration, arbitration courts, arbitral institutions. But in practice, uh, uh, my uh, sort of litigation colleagues tell me uh, that uh, Russian judges are reluctant uh, to, to use uh, online technology uh, uh, and they try to avoid it if they can, even though that the state has made a huge investment and the technology is available there and sort of procedurally uh, it is uh, allowed and permissible. Uh, but I think it's uh, sort of a learning curve. So I trust it's, it's a matter of time because uh, again, Russia is such a vast country and uh, uh, travel uh, can take time, be expensive and uh, complex. So therefore, online hearings uh, could, could be uh, advantageous for uh, all sorts of reasons. Uh, but, but also, I think that uh, uh, the, in Russian state courts, the process is, uh, is still uh, fairly sort of classical and uh, old-fashioned. Old and whereas in, the, uh, in, in London, for example, when I uh, first came across the situation, when uh, we had to obtain in interim measures from from a judge on a very large case and uh, 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 the need has come up sort of over the weekend and the judge was uh, available to take a phone call so when counsel for the parties uh, got together on the phone to, to a judge over the weekend and the judge uh, was prepared to grant uh, uh, and sort of an uh, order on interim measures over the weekend and just uh, uh, the judge said that, well, I expect that you will file uh, documents in writing first thing on Monday, but for now in the interest uh, of, of time and of the parties, I'm prepared to grant that interim injunction. So in the, in the Russian uh, court, the Russian legal system, that, that would be uh, absolutely unheard of because in the Russian court, not just the judge wouldn't do anything over the weekend or over the phone, even uh, if, if you're present in court, everything starts with powers of attorney and verification of uh, uh, if counsel attorney acting for, for a party, law acting for a party, uh, what is their sort of mandate to represent the party? Whereas uh, in English court, if a solicitor comes and says, I represent that client, that's it, because the word uh, of a solicitor is as good as a bond. Uh, well, unfortunately, in the Russian court, the word of an advocate is meaningless unless uh, it can be supported by various papers and ideally with the round blue stamp. Uh, and um, so, uh, but this is different, uh, different culture, different history. So we need to be realistic that the world is diverse and different and every country and jurisdiction is different and be realistic and appreciative of these differences. But uh, I also, I would say that uh, and as I said before, the world is now evolving at a quick pace and these differ differences, I think that they, they are becoming milder and there is the, the systems, uh, they, tr they start borrowing from each, each other uh, and, uh, and therefore I think that uh, in, in the years to come we'll see a bit more in integration and I think that international programs like that and uh, ability to learn and uh, get education from a different country and maybe try working in a different jurisdiction that all brings us uh, closer together because we learn other ways and we borrow things that we think might or should be borrowed from uh, experience of other jurisdictions and implemented at home maybe in a way that is uh, just uh, uh, most feasible uh, with the tradition and that i think that allows us to to achieve more thank you That makes a lot of sense. And out of that, I actually have a, a question arising for, for Victoria and for Eric as well. Does the HKIC or other institution uh, who are similar, um, are there mechanisms you have set up to sort of 
uh, I don't know how to phrase it, but to pull people in right from countries where you first uh, receive a license or a status and there is this adjustment period perhaps for lawyers from that country. Are there any types of mechanisms like that that, that happen behind the scenes? Or do you think that is not necessary and, and these things happen naturally? Just a quick follow up. I mean, uh, I can take that or Victoria, you want to, I think. Uh, it's fine. I can add on your, go ahead. Okay. All right. So, you know, when, whenever, I mean, we obviously, there's a lot that goes beyond behind the scenes when we're, we're working on something um, similar to, you know, the permanent arbitral institution status with Russia. Uh, one thing that HKIC has, uh, you know, has been doing very well, we have a very strong business development team. Uh, they're led by two very competent um, uh, people. Uh, and it's pretty, uh, a very, you know, good and, and very busy department. Um, so we are constantly working uh, with uh, other jurisdictions, uh, both ones that we have, you know, a close partnership with, like with, in, in Russia, uh, in, in China, in, in Latin America, but we're also pushing uh, to other sort of developing jurisdictions in general. And, and sometimes that is on a more uh, fundamental basis as to sort of uh, and, and sort of guide into what international arbitration entails and sort of th those sort of processes. And then, but in a lot more cases is about, you know, uh, specific institutional matters, uh, like what HKIAC is and, and who we are uh, and what we do. And part of that, you know, is, is involved in, you know, making sure we get you know, uh, these sort of developing jurisdictions, not only, um, you know, information as regards to HKC, but also we have uh, their voice um, in, in, in respect of uh, what we, where we go in the future. And I think that's something which we see a lot of in terms of our list of arbitrators, our panel of arbitrators, our, um, our executive committees, uh, our councils. Uh, it, you know, I think Victoria has mentioned that, you know, Professor Soskuff is, you know, is a member on our council and that's, uh, and, you know, we value very much his opinion in relation to how, you know, we, what we should be doing and how we should be improving in relation to, you know, the Russian market and the Russian audience. And we do that also mm -hmm. with other jurisdictions, which we are, you know, uh, to, to use the words, trying to pull in. Uh, but in, in, in reality is simply, you know, if, if we're going to cater to that market, we need to know what that market needs and what that market wants. Mm -hmm. If, that makes if I uh, just uh, may add, uh, I think, please, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I may just add, and um, I think that uh, in this uh, respect, uh, I think the sharing of knowledge uh, is uh, the key aspect in order to uh, have uh, a, a connection with the jurisdiction, for example, in respect of Russia, where we got the license, and it's very important important to um, have the expertise in the uh, local law uh, where uh, like the uh, um, institution establish its presence. For example, as Eric said, we have Professor Soskov on the uh, council member and uh, um, where I joined in 2019 um, and supporting the Russian arbitrary management uh, of the Russia related cases. And I also would like uh, quickly say on to an initiative that we have uh, is the first one uh, is the internship. So we regularly uh, have the um, a Russian student that uh, um, has a, a, a um, who help uh, with the case management and also loan uh, from us and we uh, we um, uh, entered in a number of uh, memorandum of understandings with the Russian also arbitration association and with the arbitration center and the uh, union of uh, in um, a Russian Union of Industrialists and Interpreters. So I think that's from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> it, it really makes sense. Um, 
I think I would like to move on to this discussion of the skills that this raises, right? Um, and this can be uh, lessons for everybody, but um, things that uh, Ilina, for example, began to bring up, right? What skills are we, if online arbitration and in the future online domestic court proceeding, proceedings are going to change some things, right? About how people interact with clients, with witnesses, with evidence, uh, in general, technological skills, we can, um, I think Alina has thoughts on this question and, and Alexander, if you do, please raise your hand, but we can also loop back to Eric in terms of the technical aspects, right? Uh, that perhaps uh, lawyers should begin to be familiar with. So a broad question, all of these new developments, right? This, this 21st century, uh, how is that changing the legal profession as a whole? What should we know? What should we be learning? How should we be learning it? That type of question. Elena, go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, just following very interesting discussion. <laughs> yes, of course, the new reality and new format of uh, pursuing uh, international arbitration or domestic court proceedings in particular requires, of course, development and adjustment of the legal uh, skills and using of the legal knowledge, how uh, in different way, as it was established in a classical way uh, for the decades, but right now, and uh, as Konstantin uh, highlighted, uh, the speed of changes, and in order to keep up with these uh, changes, uh, we have we all have to be uh, uh, learning, uh, learning new skills, learning new technology, and uh, learning the ways how to use it efficiently in a in a new way. So, in terms of digital transformation, of course, uh, moving uh, virtually uh, online line and uh, uh, pers performing virtual hearings at, the, at all level of international arbitration procedure or future enforcement of arbitration awards uh, uh, on the domestic, uh, according to the domestic rules, uh, requires, of course, complex of uh, no complex knowledge of um, uh, procedures, access to the global informational resources, and uh, uh, learning how to structure your legal research, scope of your assignment, uh, knowledge of different resources, not only the domestic ones, but also international ones. And it requires uh, well-developed uh, basic research, legal research skills. And of course, uh, it also requires certain psychological uh, adjustment as uh, Konstantin uh, correctly mentioned that, for example, Russian judges follow very conservative way because they were trained and formed as a lawyers uh, based on the civil law system, they were, um, uh, if we talk about uh, older generations, they know the Soviet period of time. So, and all this cultural and psychological things, of course, have impact. And uh, also the, there are certain reluctancy in terms of using the technology specifically in the judicial process. And, uh, but of course it takes time and, but more or less, um, more, uh, more than that, it takes knowledge because when they learn the technology, when they see the best practices, when they see how the leading international institutions like uh, Hong Kong Court of International Arbitration use the technology, operate with the legal resources, the domestics and international ones, they, of course, will understand the beauty and values of these things and hopefully will try to implement uh, these uh, tools in, into their day-to-day -day practice, specifically that the level of technology in Russia is well-developed, specifically legal tech is rapidly developed and the state is very supportive in terms of digital transformation, but it requires uh, learning a development of uh, new skills and uh, the lawyers at uh, even from the first years in the law schools and uh, for post-qualification experience, uh, they need to learn how to use it. It requires knowledge of electronic digital uh, signature and use it actively uh, and uh, it requires mutual recognition of electronic digit, uh, electronic uh, signature worldwide. I think that uh, it's uh, developing right now, this uh, initiative among different countries. I know that there are discussions. So, and uh, so far, so forth. Of course, it requires knowledge, it requires development uh, of the skills, and it requires uh, new experts who will successfully combine the knowledge of law and the knowledge of technology. If I may add to Brilliant. Please go ahead. 
mm-hmm. Elena's uh, speech, few words. I have found um, nice research on the uh, top uh, lawyers' skills, which I needed in 2021, uh, published by uh, LinkedIn. Uh, there are 10 top um, lawyer skills which are needed. First is the teamwork. Second is initiative and independence. Third one is creative problem solving. Fourth is written communication skills. Then verbal communication skills, working under pressure, commercial awareness, understanding people and attention to details. And the last one, research skills and preparation. In my personal opinion, there are three things which would be very much useful to, for uh, arbitration lawyers, I would say. Uh, the first one is to be curious and unbiased. Uh, secondly, to be internationally minded. And thirdly, last one, to be open to opportunities. I would like to pay my attention to the to the second one to be internationally minded. As I said, the cultural awareness is very is very important, and it was important in my personal experience. When you're working with uh, in international arbitration, you may be dealing with an arbitrator or opposing counsel hailing from literally anywhere in the world, you know. And knowing that fact makes them tick and their cultural awareness norm and then can make the difference between getting my point across and being misunderstood. Uh, that happened in the past with me, but never happen, happens uh, currently and will never happen in the future. What I can see common uh, with, uh, in between uh, Hong Kong International uh, arbitration court and our international program on the double diploma is both uh, very much interested in to be open-minded and to be internationally minded. And I very much appreciate, Elena, today's your opportunity to speak on that. And I very much appreciate HIAC team, both uh, Victoria and Eric, and all uh, our team uh, being participated in today's nicely organized conference. Thank you all. Thank you very, very much. That makes a lot of sense. It's interesting how we're talking about, uh, you know, virtualization and the digital space here on the online space. And what it really does in practice, what I'm hearing from all of you, is actually, you know, increase almost the human qualities that you need. So in some ways, it's interesting to see that the more virtual we go, the more you need the basic, the core of humanity to come out as well for things to function. I think it's a very, very interesting um, thing that I'm hearing from, from all of you who are practitioners in this field who see a lot of things on the ground. Um, I would like to go back to Eric and ask about the technical, the very, you know, the technological things that we should know about. And then afterwards, I will ask a final question and I'll ask everybody to comment on it, which is, um, I like, uh, there's a podcast called Trigonometry and they always ask at the end, what is something uh, that you believe we should be talking about on this topic that we have not mentioned here today or that you do not see discussed in professional circles or on the news, but that you feel should be discussed. So I will go then in a circle after Eric and, and ask everybody to comment on, on that question. And then we will wrap up. All right, well, I don't really have much to add um, based, uh, I mean, uh, Elena and Alexander basically covered most of those comments. And in terms of technology, uh, it's not really something which, uh, you need to have. You, nobody's expecting the lawyer to be the programmer and the and the the, the tech expert uh, as well. Um, but it does help. Um, I think, especially if you are now an arbitrator, uh, being able to handle yourself on a virtual hearing, to handle yourself on a Zoom call, um, I think there's a lot of confidence in relation to uh, you know in in an arbitrator to know that. You know, they will. If we have to go to a virtual hearing, that arbitrator will 
order a virtual hearing and won't just postpone the case for you know an indefinite period just simply because you're not comfortable with the technology. Um, now, there may be other reasons for postponing. I'm not saying that every postponement is, is unjustified. But there has been their fair share over the course of 2020, where a postponement may have been ordered uh, simply on the basis that the, you know, the, the tribunal doesn't trust the tech or doesn't know the tech or isn't comfortable with the tech. Um, and so having some working knowledge and, comfort, uh, and familiarity with the tools that you're using is probably the best way to, uh, uh, of uh, getting a, a accustomed to it. I mean, if you wouldn't have had to, you would have had to have gotten used to a computer or a word processor uh, back in the 80s or the 90s, and you would have had, had to use, get used to using the internet, you know, in, in the 90s and early 2000s. This is really not that much different in terms of now you have to understand how a virtual hearing works and how you can use it or how you should use it uh, and not simply be afraid of the tech. Um, I think that's not too much to ask uh, of arbitrators, and, um, and it's not too difficult. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I can imagine that you have some interesting stories on that front. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from, from various situations that you've seen. Um, okay, and for, as I promised, for our final question, and I will go in the order in which we started, right? So Victoria first, if that's possible. Um, if if you are here with us, you may, um, if your internet is a, a bit fuzzy, uh, feel free to turn off your camera to, to save the internet and, and just speak, don't worry about that. Um, what is something either that you feel um, in general, either today or in the world in general is not being talked about enough on this subject, you know, or uh, some personal experience, right, that you really want to share that would highlight such a thing. Um, if I'm, if I may, Elena, yeah, let's reach the camera. Um, we have talked uh, enough for about, I think, uh, would say the virtual uh, sphere, and uh, I think. Uh, the more issues uh, that um, we can, I would say we cannot predict uh, the, all the issues and uh, to solve or come up before the arbitrators council or the institution. I think uh, what is necessary is just uh, to be uh, flexible, for, for example, from the institution perspective, to be flexible to the needs of uh, the, uh, for example, not only uh, the parties uh, as like the main users, but also uh, to um, uh, give the support to the arbitrators, for example, who uh, are all uh, experienced, uh, but uh, for example, due to their age, they're not able to address the technology. I think that's something that all the institution could do, organizing some seminars, because I think uh, uh, not being able to use the technology, it's not the reason to be like um, left out of for your uh, profession or the your field that you are dedicated most of for your career. So they're just uh, my final comments. Thank you. Thank you. And that's actually an incredibly good point. So thank you for that. The intergenerational conversation, I think, in, in general uh, can be had and uh, something to think about for the future. It's very, very true. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric? Um, from my perspective, my I guess the thing that I would think we probably need to start talking about a little bit more is, you know, what's next? Um, we, we've talked about virtual hearings a lot um, over the course of last year, and that conversation has ranged primarily, you know, from the start of 2020 to uh, what is a virtual hearing, uh, to mid-2020, can virtual hearings work, to end of 2020, are virtual hearings here to stay? And we're still in, now in 2021 and, you know, still talking a lot about virtual hearings. But, you know, at the end of the day, what we should be talking about is what's the next step? Uh, where do we go from here? Um, not just can we go back, uh, because we're not going to be able to go back. 
what the, the question we should be we should be asking is how do we take where we've come from in 2020 and use that to take the next step forward um and i think that's what we're thinking at now and that's what we're looking at now um and i think that's where that conversation will be headed soon in the next uh several months or the next year and if i might press you a little bit on that without you know any secrets or anything but yeah. in general um what what do you mean in more detail about where should we be looking well i think we look at virtual hearings and virtual hearings was obviously a fundamental change and a fundamental response in relation to um something very traditional that uh, we took for granted uh, to uh, a certain extent and was taken away, and that was uh, international travel. Uh, you, know, with, you know, for most of us who are working in the international legal community, you know, we spent a lot of our lives on airplanes, flying from place to place, uh, going from hearing to hearing. And when that was taken away, virtual hearings arose as sort of that disruptive uh, uh, event, um, and change arise out, rises out of disruption. So when you start thinking about what's next, is so you you need to start preparing for what the next disruption is, or what the next next disruption could be, and you need to start thinking about what you know. In, when we say what's next, you have to start thinking about well, what can be, what do we take for granted now, uh, that either could be improved, or will have to be improved if 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 something does happen. Um, and I think you see a lot of that, for example, in now the rise of online dispute resolution programs. You see it in uh, in, in case management platforms. You see it in uh, artificial intelligence. You see it in green arbitration initiatives, um, because climate change is, is is something which is real and which is uh, which is occurring and, and could be you know that next disruptive event. And so I mean, I think we're starting to see that conversation shift now. To, to look at that, but I think we definitely need to start talking about, you know, what the, what the future is more and less nostalgia about, you know, when we, uh, where we were coming from. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. I feel an idea for, for a conference on the future of <laughs> dispute resolution. Uh, I think that would be a, a good thing to do. Um, Elena, same question to you. Just thinking, uh, it's a very interesting discussion and the issues that were raised. Um, I think that, uh, again, uh, going back to the uh, key issues of how and uh, in which way uh, the, this global digital transformation will be uh, used, uh, will impact the legal profession in general and legal arbitration, arbitration process in particular. So this is, of course, we'll see how the trends will be developed. And of course, uh, uh, going virtually, it uh, provides uh, more convenience, less dis uh, disruptions. And it will, uh, from the practical business standpoint of view, from the point of view of uh, convenience to provide arbitration-related services, it uh, uh, all this technology uh, allows to be more um, efficient. But it also, uh, I'm very much convinced that uh, physical at uh, attendance, physical presence, communication between interpersonal communication, of course, cannot be replaced by the technology either in ordinary life, either in professional life, of course, because interaction is, uh, uh, it's a natural thing for the human beings. And uh, however, if uh, it will be the harmonical hybrid situation in terms of performing uh, arbitration, conducting procedure, exchanging of the documents, exchanging of the information, it will uh, if it's correctly used and if the people will learn how to use it right i think we uh, will all benefit of that so and uh, the profession will be developed and the practice will be developed and um in in the most integrated way and but it takes time it uh, of course uh, raises a lot of challenges and uh, our roles as a uh, legal professionals to adjust ourselves and to teach uh, the new generation uh, how to use it in the best way i would try to answer in this your question in the in this way Hope, hopefully i did it <laughs> thank you yes yes <laughs> thank you very much and um same question to constantine uh alexander had to leave so uh constantine will be our last uh, answeree uh go ahead 
thank, thank you. Uh, 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 I think it, this was a very compre uh, comprehensive discussion. So I think that we, we have covered uh, uh, pretty much the most hot topics on the agenda. And really the message is uh, sort of uh, be very flexible, be open-minded, be prepared for change. But one thing that uh, I'd like to, to stress that we haven't uh, discussed today uh, is I believe a very important one for international arbitration is diversity uh, in arbitration. And uh, I will say that this is not something that is not talked about. So uh, it, it is also a hot topic in, in international arbitration, but I'd say that not enough is, is done. So for, for example, uh, earlier today, I mentioned that uh, London remains a very popular venue for uh, uh, Russia related disputes. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, if you look at the composition of uh, arbitration tribunals at LCIA, you will find that uh, very rarely uh, uh, Russian lawyers uh, or lawyers from CIS are, are ever uh, on, on the arbitrator's tribunal. Uh, and uh, so what, what happens is that very often Eng English lawyers uh, uh, sort of arbitrate Russian cases or common, common lawyers arbitrate civil law cases. And they, uh, while they're great professionals, and very experienced, but uh, there are things like cultural awareness and uh, market peculiarities that uh, are often, uh, uh, that for us may, may be market standard, for someone not familiar with the Russian market may come across as pe peculiar and strange. And therefore, I think that uh, international arbitration would benefit from diversity that uh, lawyers from uh, different jurisdictions, uh, from different legal families from different backgrounds uh, come together as arbitrators on arbitrators panel. I think that would be beneficial uh, for the purposes of justice and, and the arbitrating parties. And in, in this context, I would like to praise actually uh, HKIC because uh, HKIC uh, uh, does have a very diverse uh, list of arbitrators and, in, including uh, Russian practitioners as myself uh, on, on that list, uh, and it is expanding. And I think this is a very uh, sort of uh, important uh, uh, factor. And uh, I think that's because uh, international arbitration is international by definition, it, it's in its name, it's inevitable that uh, the, there should be a more diversity and stronger diversity, and we, we should tackle this issue and talk more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it, it ties to what you said with respect to sanctions as well as, if I, as I understood because uh, sanctions have had uh, very unpredictable effects right now that we're a few years out from them. And I think in the same way, diversity um, and Alexander also brought this up, right? It has some predictable effects, but it also has so many, so many bonuses and chain reactions that are impossible to predict um, without this space for, for experimentation. Um, oh, sorry, I will mute. Um, so <laughs> thank you all very, very much. This was a wonderful discussion, highly enjoyable, and I hope informative for our audience. Um, and please, uh, we'll stay in touch. And I hope for our audience that you stay in touch as well. And I just want to wish everybody a wonderful, wonderful day. So thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you very much. Have a Thank nice you. day. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Запись остановлена.